back on the communicators. Guests will give their perspectives on the ability of the United States government to shut down Internet communications in the event of a cybersecurity attack, plus a discussion on the use of the Internet in the Middle East. In the last Congress, Senators Lieberman, Collins, and Carper introduced legislation called the Protecting Cyberspace as a National Asset Act. In this bill, it would enhance the Homeland Security Act of 2002 and other laws to enhance the security and resiliency of the cyber and communications infrastructure of the United States. This bill died when the 11th, 111th Congress ended. However, there have been reports that it will be reintroduced in the 112th Congress. Karen Evans is a former administrator for e-government of the Office of Management and Budget. Ms. Evans, what, did this, what would this bill do? How would it change the laws? It's a, a really look at taking a comprehensive approach of trying to update many of the statutes that are already on the books to reflect the environment that we're in right now and the dependence on telecommunication services, cybersecurity types of activities, and bring clarity and alignment to roles and responsibilities within the federal sector. Would it enhance what the president can do now when it comes to communications? So I know there's a lot of interpretations that are going around about this, especially the piece that talks about national cyber emergencies. And in my view, as a former policy official, this was my area, that the president currently under many of the provisions already has authorities to do certain things under a national emergency. What, what this act is doing is clarifying those and bringing those up to date. So, for example, under the Communications Act of 1934, there are certain things that the president can already do if there's a state of emergency. This is trying to clarify those and update that role and responsibility and recognize how we use things that we call cyber and what that environment of cyber really includes. So where did the term kill switch come from? Well, when they start reading this in the one particular section, it says that the president can declare a national cyber emergency to cover critical infrastructure, which is all private industry. When you, you know, if you really get into this, for example, the Department of Homeland Security, this, this really takes all of that into consideration and really clarifies their role going forward because they're not very old. And they came about from September 11th. And so when you, you look at this, this is really clarifying what would happen under the critical infrastructure. So it's saying that if, if there's a national emergency, he can cover, they can cover this over to the critical infrastructure and they can take appropriate actions to disrupt or, or address what is happening as a cyber incident. So I believe what people are, re are really taking a look at that, and they're calling it, quote, unquote, the Internet kill switch. But if you go on and you read more details within the statute, the president just can't do that in isolation without taking into consideration other rules of law that already exist. But I would like to give you one example, though, to show that the president really does have the authority, whether this um, bill were to pass or not. So if you think back to September 11th and think of the air traffic that was happening, the president grounded all airplanes coming into the United States space. And he did that to protect the American people. That's taking that kind of scenario in the cyber world and giving the president, bringing clarity to that, and on that type of infrastructure so that people would know what would happen in the case of an emergency. Well, given what's happened in Egypt over the last week and a half or so, uh, Senators Lieberman, Collins, and Carper uh, issued statements talking about their proposed legislation. And here's part of what they had to say. We would never sign on to legislation that authorize a president or anyone else to shut down the Internet. Emergency or no, the exercise of such broad authority would be an affront to our Constitution. But our current laws do give us reason to be concerned. Most important under current law, in the event of a cyber attack, the President's authorities are broad and ambiguous, a recipe for encroachments on privacy and civil liberties. What, what, what are some of the ambiguities in the current law, Karen Evans? So in my opinion from working on this, in the past is, is that you're using uh, statutes and interpretations that were based before 
the pervasiveness of the Internet. So they do go back. The Telecommunications Act and those types of activities go back. Um, and, and you have to update it. And, and even furthermore, when those acts were passed, there was not a Department of Homeland Security that could broker a lot of these types of things of what kind of actions you would take with private industry. That, that's what one of the challenges are here. I don't think anybody um, here in the United States would sign on or endorse legislation that would violate privacy or civil liberties. And so, um, and that's what I think to their point is, is that this legislation is attempting to clarify some of those areas going forward. And you saw this play out again in the previous administration when they went through a lot of the FISA reform and what would you know what happens on wiretaps and what constitutes electronic surveillance and what are those records you need to bring clarity to that situation and that's what this act is attempting to do is bring clarity to that too so that people know exactly what will happen when okay uh, the senators also talked about their legislation here's a little bit more of what they had to say our legislation specifically says the president can only invoke the emergency authorities if there is an ongoing or imminent attack that would cause national or regional, regional ca catastrophic effects. Who gets to define uh, a national emergency as such? Well, the legislation also goes on to say that you have to define that. And so there's a structure that's being put in place that talks about um, a center being established at the Department of Homeland Security and that there would be a director, and they're very specific about what the the authorities of that director at Homeland Security would have in the cyber arena, and that they would have to put together what the rules are in conjunction with the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, the Office of Management and Budget, the Attorney General, which then would take into consideration all the other types of rules of law that we have, and they would have to define what those actions are and, and what, what constitutes that a catastrophic event. And so when you really look at the timing you know, of when this came up, what was happening in the world then as well and what's happening now, for example, everyone knows what was happening then was a lot of things were happening. Do you remember Estonia where there was a whole huge of denial of service attacks against uh, infrastructure there in Estonia? And, and what ended up happening was that happened, and then there was a physical move that came in from Russia. What this is saying is, okay, that's possible that you could have these types of situations happening, and we should have the authorities and have plans in place so that people know what happens should, that, should those types of actions occur. Karen Evans, uh, going back to Egypt and the, the s seeming ease with which the government shut down mobile and Internet traffic there, do you, do you understand people's concerns about this, about the potential of shutting down the Internet, and do you think that the legislation could be altered in any way to, to uh, reassure people? So, yes, it, it, I can see where people would be concerned, but you would also have to look at how our country, our country works a little bit differently um, because there's really no technical way. You just don't go in and there's one switch and you turn it off. So we have multiple service providers here in the United States. What would have to happen for something like that to happen here is, is that our service providers would have to agree to shut off the services. And, um, and given the rule of law and everything that we have here, I would find it incredibly hard to believe unless they were convinced and they knew what the rules were, which is what this legislation is attempting to bring to the table and have that discussion that they would actually say, okay, fine, we're going to shut everything down just because you asked us to because you don't like what somebody's saying. I, I, it, they, our service providers would have to agree to do that, and the government would have to ask them to do it. They can't just go in and say, okay, we're going to take it all off. Now, I do can see the concern where people would read this and say, well, the president could declare a national cyber emergency and therefore then take everything off. That's what's being debated. But you really have to then work through and define what that's going to be and then be very clear what constitutes a cyber emergency. As a former e-government official at the Office of Management and Budget, in your view, is this legislation vital? So I'm of the ilk that, you know, the less legislation and the more policies that are in place for clarification for the executive branch is a lot easier to implement. 
Um, but I do understand in this particular case, and this is why I am supportive of this, there was not a Department of Homeland Security when a lot of these things came through. And so if you're going to ask the Department of Homeland Security to do certain things, then you need to be clear and make sure that they have the statutory authorities to do that. Karen Evans is the former administrator for e-government at the Office of Management and Budget from 2003 to 2009 under the Bush administration. Thank you, Ms. Evans, for joining us on The Communicators. Thank you for inviting me. Now joining us is Timothy Carr. He is the campaign director at the Free Press Action Fund. Mr. Carr, you heard that interview. What are your thoughts about uh, this legislation that we've been discussing? Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with Karen's <clears throat> fundamental point, and that is, yes, that we do need to bring clarity to these issues. We live in a new era where, where cyber threats are real. Uh, cyber attacks have happened, and, <clears throat> and, uh, and I agree that we need to get a better understanding of that and bring clarity to the issue. The problem is that, that, that this bill as it was written in 2010, doesn't do that. It's both vague and broad, which is really the problem. And, and the way we at Free Press interpreted it is, is creating this sort of open-ended authority for a cybersecurity director to take control over what um, I'm sure is a substantial portion of our nation's Internet infrastructure. And it, the, the language itself doesn't permit an actual inter, Internet kill switch uh, or it doesn't create an actual Internet kill switch, but it permits uh, it, a, an executive branch authority to mandate the private sector, Internet service providers, uh, to respond to an order to turn things down, to shut things off. Mr. Carr, could you give, give an example of what you mean by vague and broad, and where, uh, how, how would you change it? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. The, the, I mean, if you, if you look... There are sections of the bill uh, that concern us the most, and, and one is sections uh, 248 and 249, where it, it, what, it doesn't give a clear definition, again, of what a proper threat is. The, the definition of what critical infrastructure is is not well provided. In addition, it doesn't give clear recourse for a private sector, Internet service providers, to appeal an order, uh, it seems to house far too much authority in the executive branch without the sort of proper checks and balances we would expect uh, in any action that fundamentally threatens our right to free speech. And you have to remember here that the Internet in the 21st century is the most important engine of free speech that we have, that the people have, the American people have, and it's not simply a question uh, of grounding airplanes, as was the case in, in 2001, but a question of shutting down the most important engine for free speech. And so the, the comparison there that, that, that Ms. Evans made, I would, I would disagree with. I think that we have to look at the First Amendment implications in this bill and make sure that in whatever rewritten version that's put forth, has uh, has real clarity about how uh, uh, you know that prote about protecting our basic civil rights. Well, uh, Mr. Carr, uh, I want to go back to what Senators Lieberman, Collins, and Carper said this week in a statement, and this is regarding the First Amendment. The legislation expressly forbids any action that would violate the First Amendment and also prohibits limiting internet traffic, emails, and other forms of communication except those between critical infrastructure providers, unless no other action would prevent a regional or national catastrophe? Well, the, I think their statement earlier this week was a step forward. I would like to see the specific language in whatever new version of the bill they're looking, uh, they're looking to propose before, before passing judgment. I'll, I can say that the, the legislation, which was introduced in 2010, doesn't clarify that protection. In fact, their statement seems to be the strongest clarification of that that I have seen. We need to see it in the language of the proposed bill as, uh, as well before we can, we can take comfort that they are indeed moving in the right direction. It's interesting also to note that on Friday, the day that, that Egypt chose to shut down its Internet, uh, White House Press Secretary Gibbs said that he believed, and I guess he was speaking on behalf of the White House, 
that Internet access and the right to social networking is a basic individual right. And I'd like to see the White House make good on that pledge uh, and make sure that – make good on that pledge in policy and make sure that we don't see uh, bills that lack clarity uh, about that basic right, the basic right to, to connect and to, and to access the Internet, which I believe and Free Press believes is fundamental. Mr. Carr, could you see yourself supporting legislation along the lines that the senators have, have uh, introduced? I would have to see the language of the legislation. I, I, I'm appreciative of their concern about the First Amendment implications here. Uh, if they are planning, indeed, to introduce something in the new Congress, uh, we would have to take a, a look at the bill before, before our passing judgment. Timothy Carr is with the Free Press Action Fund. Thank you for being on the communicators as well. The bill itself, Protecting Cyberspace, is a National Asset Act of 2010. Again, it died in the 111th Congress, but it's been proposed to be reintroduced in the 112th Congress. It is online at cspan.org. Just follow the link to the communicators. Up next on the communicators is Deborah Wheeler. She's a professor at the United States Naval Academy, and we'll be talking about the Internet and the Middle East. We're now joined by Deborah Wheeler, who is a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy and the author of this book, The Internet in the Middle East. And we invited her to be on The Communicators to talk about what's happened in Egypt and how it's happened. Deborah Wheeler, how was the country of Egypt, the government of Egypt, able to shut down mobile and Internet traffic for six days? Well, thank you so much for having me. And before I get started, I just want to say that my views today will be my own and not representative of the Naval Academy or the United States government. So, but back to your fundamental question. Yeah, shutting down the Internet, right? Our worst nightmare. Um, actually, most Egyptians' worst nightmare as well. And as you saw, when they shut it down, not only did the government lose $90 million during that two-day hiatus of Internet traffic, but the um, protest actually grew. Uh, rather than declining and some have argued that that's because all of the bored teenagers who don't have jobs and are educated and computer savvy had nothing to do so they may as well go join the protests so it backfired. But how did they do it? Well um, a lot of the countries that I study have very very careful connections to the internet meaning that traffic is managed either through a ministry of communication or a ministry of information um, or through a number of loyal corporate uh, entities so that if, they, if you get a problem like what's going down in Egypt, they can call a few CEOs on the phone and tell them to stop service. And how do they stop the service, literally? I mean, is there such a thing as a kill switch? Is there, is there a way to stop traffic at the border or via satellite? Um, from what I've been told, it's basically a matter of removing the ISP addresses from the roster of applicable traffic and then they can just close it down. It's like shutting down a pipe. Um, but I'm not a specialist on the IT side of things. I tend to focus on the social and political and economic impact of these more technical um, relationships. And we'll get to that. You said at the beginning though that 90 million dollars was lost mm -hmm. in, in what? Government re revenue and taxes, that type of thing? Commerce, revenue, um, a number of banks have shut down operation in Egypt. The Bank of Abu Dhabi pulled um, its 12 branches. Uh, the, the Moody ratings, Standards and Poor ratings, um, have now been downgraded. So this spells economic crisis for Egypt. And Egypt was already in a form of economic crisis before the protests with the rising cost of food, um, gas, etc. In a country like Egypt, how do most people access the Internet? Good question. Um, the government, I started writing about this back in 2000 when I spent time in Egypt. Um, in those early days, really what this was all about was getting information technology into people's hands, training them for the knowledge economy, and trying to bring in foreign direct investment. Not just for the whole, not for the whole country, but for those select few who would be a part of the e-commerce wave. Um, as part of that process, the government of Egypt built telecenters, small community access points throughout the country, including in poor areas, and then tried to train people like for telecenter jobs, etc. Once that happened, <coughs> things were starting to grow in terms of internet access. 
Um, but the thing that really changed things the most was that the government established these 777 numbers so that you could use your home phone and your laptop or your computer and just dial in to a 777 number and your internet access would be free at that point. So that rose the number of internet users from 250,000 to 3 million in a matter of four or five months. In Egypt alone? In Egypt alone. Okay. So are people accessing the internet uh, via their homes or at internet cafes? Yes. So I've given you the picture of the people who actually have a laptop and a home phone, which is going to, again, be a relatively small community of people. Um, but there are internet cafes on every corner. And Just is that how the majority of people access, get information from the internet? Yes. Um, a colleague of mine that works for the United Nations Development Program in Egypt said that 80 or 90 percent of all Egyptians get their access through a public access point, an internet cafe or a telecenter. That was in 2004, so things might have changed by then. Now, in the Middle East, what, what's the percentage of people using the internet? Yeah, very good question. And I've been trying to do case study analysis to try and find that out. And the reason is because if 80% of the public is going online at a public access point, that gives you an IP address, you know, maybe five for the computers in that cafe, but maybe 100 or 200 people are using that IP address per week. So I spend a lot of time with research assistants in internet cafes interviewing people who are using it and asking them how many hours do you spend online, where do you go, how, do you have access at home or at school or at, the, at work. And what we found is that the majority of people we interviewed in Egypt and Jordan were going online at a public access point, spending on average 12 hours a week in an internet cafe. So definitely a part of their everyday life. And then you add mobile phones and Twitter and blogs and everything else. Now, what kind of sites are they accessing for the most part? Yes. Now, what we found was that we were interested in what they were using it for, for example. So 97 to 99 percent are using it for email. Um, about 80 or 90 percent using it for chatting. So that was an, a very important point. And they were saying that we're chatting with people in the international community locally, we're sharing our opinions, we're, we're learning to uh, participate in world affairs. And that was back 2004, 2000. So that was my first sense that something was up, that the presence of these technologies was constructing a kind of civic culture and preparing the ground for democratic participation. Um, and where do they go now? I mean, we've been doing some surveying. Many people, I know you have this article here, many people have a Facebook page or are blogging. Um, so the, the activities online have really exploded with developing content rather than just consuming Have it. you found in your research, Deborah Wheeler, that uh, political participation has increased in the Middle East mm -hmm. because of internet and mobile phone services? Yes, yeah, so when I was in Kuwait in 2009 teaching at American University in Kuwait and the students did some surveying just to try to find out what impact is the internet having on Kuwaiti society. And for the first time in history we were able to document that more than 80 percent of the people surveyed said the technology was having an impact on local politics and they would give explanations. You know, the state can't hide anymore, uh, we all can voice our opinions freely, um, the, a new era is dawning, etc. Um, that was 2009. Again, I'm sitting here as a political scientist saying, okay, well, show me the money. You know, where's the change in institutionalized power? And so I was writing a book called um, Information Without Revolution? Uh, and I've been working on that for the last four years. And lo and behold, you know, Tunisia shows that there is going to be significant political change. Now, currently in the Middle East, uh, besides the shutdown in Egypt, is there censorship on the Internet? Yes. Now, for example, I just got back from Abu Dhabi. Um, they have about 80 percent of the population in Abu Dhabi has A relatively access. wealthy country. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but they do have one of the heaviest, like, heavy-handed firewalls in the region. And you're saying, okay, that doesn't make sense. So many people have access. Firewall, why are you censoring the Internet? And what the government will tell you is that if they don't censor it, people there won't allow it into their homes. 
because they don't want their children having access to things that could be. So are we talking like pornography and things like that? Exactly. So what? they'll tell you it's not about politics, it's about pornography and you know, blasphemous materials. Okay. So could people or can people access things like U.S. government sites, mm -hmm. uh, Radio Free America, uh, the New York Times? Yes, and in fact they do. Uh, most of the people that we have surveyed read a daily newspaper and are using the internet to get access to news and information. That's one of the big draws to the technology. So, How effective was the Egyptian shutdown? Do you know, I mean, the, I've seen graphs where the traffic went from here all the way down to here, but there seemed to be some traffic still still going through. Yeah, some people are going to have those G4 mobile units and accessing the technology that way. And how does that, why does that make a difference? Uh, because you're linking with a satellite system, a GPS satellite system, so, but it's very expensive, so it's going to be the elite that are, that are doing that. Um, and so Egypt was not able to shut that down, is that not correct? Not completely. And the other thing is, what I'm trying to write about and to study is a shift in culture and identity. And if you're looking at the technologies reshaping the way people live and what their expectations are and how they interact with their government and with their society, you can't shut that down. You know, it's like learning to eat with a fork and then you go camping and you forget your fork and you go and find a stick to try to feed yourself. In the same way, the Egyptians, when the authorities shut the internet down, they just started faxing things or printing things and distribu distributing them word of mouth. Um, you can't, you cannot put that back in a bottle, that genie's out, so to speak. In Egypt, I noticed some statistics, I believe through your research, that even though it's got the largest population of about 69, 70 some million people, mm -hmm. a very small percentage of people were online. In fact, a higher percentage of people in Iran were mm -hmm. online than they are in Egypt. Yes, exactly, and that's, it's a statistic that we, we don't really know what to do with because in 2009 the Iranians had their own attempt to change institutionalized power and they failed basically. Uh, and was you're there saying, an internet shutdown? There was in not. Iran. There was not a complete shutdown. Certain sites were were jammed or blocked, um, but they didn't completely shut the internet down in Iran. Um, in Tunisia, they didn't completely shut the internet down. They had certain Facebook sites blocked and things like that, but again, not a complete shutdown. So why, why did Tunisia succeed so quickly? Why did Ben Ali leave? I mean, that's a big question that we're all going to be asking until we can talk with him directly and figure out what happened. Well, what's your, what's your conclusion at this point? I think he was worried about his safety and the safety of his family, and he was convinced by people in the military that this wasn't going away and that he should pack and leave with grace. And in Mubarak's case, I don't know what's delaying the process. Uh, we're in a stalemate situation now. Uh, the economy's come to a screeching halt. Uh, they're losing money daily in large amounts. The, the Investor confidence in the country is going down significantly. Tourism is not going to return immediately. So there needs to be some kind of movement in this process. From the Washington Post uh, in the last couple of days, Facebook's Egypt conundrum is the name of the article. And I just want to read something and get your response to this. Okay. Facebook is also looking at whether it should allow activists to have a measure of anonymity on the Facebook site. Has, Facebook, Google, Twitter, YouTube, have they become de facto political forces? Yes, and that, that article is interesting because, uh, as you know, Google tried to re-engineer with, was it Talk, Say, Say It or something? There's a company called Say It that they, they got together so that Egyptians could tweet through their phone. So they could call, leave a message. It was a free phone number because they wanted to support activism, whereas Facebook is like, well, we're not in the business for activist purposes, so we're going to have to see. They are in the business for activism, whether they want to be or not. <laughs> so what role did Facebook and Twitter play in what's happened in Egypt in the last week or so? Yes, and you can give two different answers. You could say, well, it made all the difference. Look at all those people that they mobilized using social media. Um, but then you can say it didn't play as big of a role as we might have thought because when they shut down the internet, the mobilization grew. So I think that it definitely, I think rather than looking at this particular event, 
or the particular event in, in Tunisia that created this massive change, or the particular event in Iran that created mobilization. What we need to look at is the way in which the culture, the society, the economy, and the political structure is changing. Because all of these information technologies exist within a context. And that context helps to shape what these technologies and tools mean. And what is that context? That context is the culture and the, the economy and the unemployment rates and all of those other things. So the way I look at it, when people become used to using a communicating tool, it changes how they live. And if they have grievances and they feel like they have a chance to express those grievances, whether it's online or in the privacy of their own home, those grievances tend to get expressed. And when those grievances collect, and that's where the social media comes in, to see I'm not alone in this, I've got a million people here or two million people that feel exactly the same way I do, and together we're going to go into the square and challenge the government. The social media tools allow the Egyptian people to reach critical mass in a way that without it, they seem to not be able to do. Professor Wheeler, have you been monitoring tweets and et cetera's from other countries, such as Yemen, Jordan, some of the countries that seem to be having a little bit of a rebellion? Yes, now Yemen's a very interesting case. 1.8% of the society in Yemen has access to the internet. 1.8%? 1.8%, and that re represents more than 2,000% growth from 2000 to 2010. Is it because of the poverty? Is it because of the government restrictions? It's both, yeah, illiteracy, poverty, government restrictions, put it all together, uh, lack of literacy in English. Um, but the basic point is that we're having rebellions in Yemen without massive access to the internet. So that would be a case where if you're trying to make a case for social media, you don't want to include Yemen in your equation at this point. Um, but Jordan, 28%, uh, almost 30% of the society in Jordan has access to the internet. The king, under the king of double fund, starting in 2000, but going full throttle up in 2004, built telecommunity, uh, telecommunity centers throughout the country, including in impoverished areas. And again, wants to be part of that digital economy, but it's a double-edged sword. You give people access, and they're going to communicate their demands. And the Jordanians have said they want fairly and freely elected representative government. The king can stay. He doesn't have to be elected, but his government does need to be. And we just have to see how that plays out. Have you seen any more governments in the Middle East uh, restricting access to the Internet or restricting mobile services? Mm -hmm. Actually, what I've been observing is the opposite, that, for example, in um, Algeria, the president there is saying that we're going to have an end to emergency law coming soon. Um, Jordan's king dissolved his parliament, or dissolved his cabinet, dismissed his prime minister, put an interim prime minister in place, and is trying to work towards change. The Syrians, supposedly this weekend, are mobilizing against emergency laws. So it seems like people are trying to learn from the Egyptian and Tunisian examples to manage the change uh, in more moderate ways rather than face revolution. Well, Deborah Wheeler, on the other side of this is terrorism mm -hmm. and the use of the Internet by al-Qaeda, et cetera. Is that still a factor? Yes, and one person I was having a conversation from somebody within the intelligence community, and he was saying, look at al-Qaeda of the Arabian Gulf, AQ. AG, I guess is what they're calling it. And supposedly that group is very actively using the internet for recruitment uh, purposes. They have a journal called in, uh, Enlightenment, or Inspire. Inspire is the name of their journal. And they've just said that they've gotten very skilled at recruiting, especially Westerners. Jihad Jane was supposedly recruited by them. Um, but what I always say to my students is that this is a very, very small percentage of the people in the region. It's a fringe movement, and really I hope that what's happening in Egypt and in Tunisia and Jordan and Yemen refocuses people's attention on the masses and what they're asking for, which is the same thing that you and I want, you know, freedom, a good job, a good life. Deborah Wheeler, what are you currently teaching at the U.S. Naval Academy? Well, I have a seminar called New World Disorder Middle East. <laughs> Why is that important to teach at the Naval Academy? Well, we have future Marine Corps and Naval officers who, in that particular seminar, within months are going to be in the service of this country, in many in the regions that we're talking about today, 
and it just gives them an opportunity to do a 30-page research paper on a topic of their choice as long as it relates to that theme in some way, shape, or form. So, Why is it important? I think that the Middle East isn't going anywhere quickly. I think that it's an area of strategic importance. Uh, General Petraeus has said that uh, we're interested in oil, we're interested in stability, we're interested in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and those issues are just going to become more important in this information age. So we need our men and women in uniform to be aware. So finally, if you had to make a definitive statement about the role of social media in the Middle East and in what's happening in Egypt, what would that definitive statement as of today be? It's a game changer. Deborah Wheeler is a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. We appreciate your participation on The Communicators. Thanks for having me.